So it was just announced that the Hubble Space Telescope has observed the farthest single star uh, ever seen ever in history. Could you tell me a bit about this discovery, how it happened and what it really means? Oh, OK, sure. Yeah, absolutely. This is a, a wonderful surprise. This is something that we didn't think the Hubble Space Telescope would be capable of. We're seeing a, a star, you know, either an individual star, perhaps a binary star, but it's so far away. It's kind of mind blowing. Uh, the, the light actually took about 13 billion years to get to us, probably a little bit less, like 12.9. But 13 billion years, that's incredible when you think about the fact that the Big Bang was about 13.8 billion years ago. And so this star we're seeing is, is, is back in time to the very early universe, probably one of the first generations of stars to ever exist. And the reason we're able to see an individual star this far away has this, is this it's a beautiful coincidence. So there is a, a cluster of galaxies. You know, galaxies, of course, have hundreds of billions of stars in them. And there's quite a large cluster of galaxies that's closer to us than the star. Uh, the, the, the cluster of galaxies we see as they were about, about 5 billion years ago. And this is sort of amazing. This goes all the way back to Albert Einstein. What, what gravity really is, is a bending of space and time itself. And so this nearer cluster of galaxies is actually bending space around it, and it's forming a natural lens. I mean, it's a lens made of space and time itself. And so what's happening is that this nearer galactic cluster is bending space, and then way, way back farther, just a coincidence, this one star happens to line up just right with the lens so that it becomes thousands of times magnified. So the, the reason Hubble can see this star at all is this wonderful natural effect called gravitational lensing. That's one of the most eloquent uh, explanations for gravitational <laughs> lensing I think I've heard. Um, yeah, it, it's fascinating that you know, between the power of the telescope itself and this incredible natural phenomenon that astronomers like yourself are able to kind of take advantage of, um, you can really multiply the, the power of an instrument like Hubble. Well, absolutely. So the, the star itself uh, is a very massive star. It's about 50 times the mass of the sun. Wow. And, and this actually corresponds to what we've been, you know, hypothesizing, kind of guessing about what the first stars would be like. And um, and so this star itself is, is probably at least a million times as bright as the sun. Wow. And then and then you have this natural telescope, this natural lens, and that's magnifying it thousands of times more. So so that that's why we can see this at all. And 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 the reason it's so fascinating to us is because we we know that the, the first generations of stars had to be very different than the stars today. They had different chemistry because uh, you know the Big Bang created hydrogen and helium. And then everything else that's around us, like you know, the calcium in my bones and my teeth and the iron in my blood, the carbon that makes me up, uh, that was all made through stellar fusion, through stars actually putting bigger and bigger atoms together in their cores. There's there's no way the universe makes iron, you know, for your, your blood other than a massive star fusing that in its core and then exploding. And so the first generation of stars that hadn't happened yet, their chemistry is different. They probably came together when the universe was much denser. The universe was smaller. There was more material to pack together. And they created that, that, that pretty much all of the stuff that you see around you that's in your body. So th this is really significant because we're seeing one of the stars that's mostly responsible for all of the stuff around you that made life possible. That's incredible. So I know you touched on this a bit, but how does this star and at least these kind of initial observations of this star line up with the expectations for what stars at that early time in the universe should look like? Is it is it aligning exactly? Have there been any surprises along the way in, in studying this star? Well, so our, our guess is that this star, which has the wonderful name of Arendelle, and uh, that's actually uh, that's actually from Tolkien. That, that's you know that's actually from the Lord of the Rings, uh, the Silmarillion actually, and uh, it um, it means the dawn star, mm -hmm. and it's an old English word. It's lovely, and this is a star literally from the dawn of time, the dawn the dawn of stars forming. We suspect it's not the absolute first generation of stars. We think that maybe this is one of the subsequent, just you know, maybe, maybe a couple tens of millions of years after star formation uh, began. There's probably some of these heavy elements in this star, but 
the farther back we see, the more we're able to piece together this 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 idea about what were the first stars like. Um, we actually suspect that the very first stars might have been larger still. And this is something that we're hoping the James Webb Space Telescope will give us clues about. The, the, the first stars might have been these sort of giant collapsing cores of hydrogen, maybe thousands of times the mass of the sun. And they just blew apart almost as quickly as they formed. There's a, there's a big mystery that uh, we, we see these giant black holes. And you know, as far as we know, black holes are made when a giant star dies. But we see these massive black holes so far back in time, black holes that are millions or even billions of times the mass of the sun. We don't know how they formed so quickly. So you know, what was the first generation of stars even bigger and even closer so that they all sort of exploded and collapsed into giant black holes? That's, that's part of what we're going after with the, the coming James Webb Space Telescope observations. Definitely. Yeah, just touching on Webb, as you mentioned, uh, you know, while Hubble is very powerful and will continue to be extremely valuable and was able to spot this star with gravitational lensing, Webb is specifically designed to view infrared, um, which allows it to see much further. So do you think that, you know, with or without the aid of, you know, gravitational lensing, that, that Webb will be able to see as far back um, or as far out as this star or much further? How, how far do you expect that reach to extend? Well, certainly, you know, we are hoping for, you know, absolutely as far out as the star is now. And I mean, this gives you some idea of how the two telescopes work in conjunction. So this star was found, I mean, honestly, you know, a bit accidentally that the wonderful young man who found it is actually a graduate student. He's a PhD candidate still. And uh, and so he managed to identify the single star that's being gravitationally lensed. And then uh, what Webb will do is, you know, Webb has much more light gathering capability, much more sensitive instruments. We're hoping Webb will do uh, the, the spectroscopy, the chemistry of what the star is like, how hot it is, give us some idea whether it's, you know, almost the first generation or a little bit more in. The, um, the, the, the challenge is that we're right up against something called the cosmic dark ages. Uh, when you go so far back in time, the gas between the stars in the universe was actually cooler than it is now, mm -hmm. and it actually absorbed light very well. And then the first generation of stars heated everything up, and it actually made the, these, the, the gas between the stars hotter and more transparent to light. So there's sort of a natural barrier that we're trying to see just up to the, you know, the envelope of, and maybe if we're lucky, There'll be bits of that barrier that are kind of sparse. The gas will have sort of bubbles that we can look into and see that first generation of stars. But we're, we're right about there. So yeah, this is, you know, we hope Webb will see just a little bit farther, but uh, definitely out as far. Definitely. So in looking at the bigger picture with this discovery, with the hopeful future discoveries with Webb, um, what do discoveries like this mean for our overall understanding of the universe? Obviously, you know, when you're looking back in time so close to the Big Bang, I'm, I'm sure that there is a lot of information that, that can be extrapolated. Um, so I'm just curious in your opinion, how, how does something like this and, and these projected future discoveries, um, how, how does this enlighten us? Well, like I said, this is a big deal because we see things at the very edge of our ability to see out into space that um, we just don't understand. I mean, I mean that, that that's a wonderful part of discovery when you're looking at something right in front of your eyes and you're just like, I, I have no idea how that happened. And these giant black holes so soon in the universe are one of those. So the more we can learn about these first generation of stars, the more we can understand how these huge black holes formed. And then these black holes may have had something to do with how galaxies form, because every galaxy we observe seems to have a big black hole lurking right in the center. You know, so you have the whole evolution. How did the first black holes, first stars, first galaxies form? And, and then, as I mentioned, there's this, there's this, you know, this wonderful, you know, very intimate part of it that the universe seems to be only hydrogen and helium. Then the first generation of stars produces all of this other stuff. And all of a sudden you have planets and people and cats and, you know, whatever. And so, you know, we're, we're looking back to a time when literally the atoms in your body, everything besides hydrogen and helium were formed. That, that is so incredible. We're looking back to when everything formed that allowed all the conditions for life to be possible. Definitely. Um, now, you know, with Webb um, hopefully becoming fully science operational as expected this summer, do you foresee Hubble shifting priorities um, now that you know Webb will be you know capable of, of seeing that far out of doing 
you know, similar observations in some ways. Do you see Hubble kind of shifting priorities so that there isn't overlap? Well, you know, it's funny because in some cases, uh, overlap is exactly what's going on here in a good way. You know, Hubble finds the star, Webb can follow up on the star. The um, the, the Hubble Space Telescope, and, and as will Webb be when it gets fully commissioned, is a public observatory. So it's not really even up to NASA to name what the priorities are. People from all over the world write in proposals every year. And then there's a committee of, you know, of astronomers, again, from all over the world that decide on what the, the top level science is from the proposals they get. So I would imagine there are definitely things that will, uh, you know, somebody will say, well, we found this with Hubble. We want to follow up with Webb. But, you know, those two sets of observations will be completely coordinated. You know, it's, it's not just that the two telescopes are looking randomly around the sky and they might sort of you know, overlap and do each other's work. But that's not how it works. It's very, very specifically pointing each one every single second that it, it's up there. And uh, and so I think there'll be a lot of Hubble looks at it and Webb looks at it to see different things. I think that will happen a lot. Definitely. Have you have you already seen any proposals to look at Arendelle using Webb? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. So um, th that has been submitted. That the person that discovered it has submitted that. I would anticipate that that will be accepted. Um, amazingly, the, the first year of science for Webb has already been proposed and accepted. Mm -hmm. um, we already had the proposal cycle last year. And um, I, I'm very proud of that proposal cycle for a number of reasons. We decided to redo the whole process of how astronomers around the world propose. And we now have the most uh, diverse set of astronomers, uh, diverse in terms of people of color, in terms of gender, and in terms of how far along they are in their career. We have the most number of young scientists that got time. I should say early career scientists. I don't know how old they actually are, but uh, you know, it, it's a, it, it was sort of a, a wonderful way of redesigning things to make sure the best science proposals won. And uh, I'm very proud of that. That's super exciting. Um, so I just have one one final question, and it's just kind of uh, you know your feelings and thoughts on the matter. I'm sure that you know as an astronomer, uh, this is a very exciting finding, um, and I'm just curious how this finding and looking to the future, you know, with Webb and with future observations with Hubble, how that feels to be kind of in this moment. It's so much joy. Um, you know, this whole year, I mean, so 2022, so we start on December 25th with the launch of the James Webb Telescope, and then all of us are really literally biting our nails. I mean, we, we knew that this was a very risky mission. It was audacious, unfolding a giant telescope in space, sending it so far away that it's not serviceable by astronauts. And then one thing after another starts to go perfectly. And, and yes, I mean, I've seen images coming down. The images are going to be spectacular. I know we've released some of the engineering images, but we have others coming down as we speak. And it's it's working better than we even expected. And not only, you know, is, um, you know, have my friends in some cases worked 25 years on the Webb telescope, but uh, it was it was also the primary uh, uh, instrument that my, my husband worked on, who unfortunately passed away before it launched. So, you know, this is this is family and this is this is heart stuff. You know, we 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 send we send our souls, our hearts and souls up with these instruments. Definitely. Well, I I'm I can only imagine that there is a lot for you tied up in this. And I'm so thrilled for you to see the continued success. And I can't wait to share those images with you. <laughs> Oh, they're going to be great. Yeah, they're, they're going to be absolutely beautiful. And 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 as I mentioned, um, you know, you know, Webb sees it in invisible light. So yeah. these are images that our eyes wouldn't be sensitive to. But what will happen is they'll be translated into colors to make beautiful imagery. We're not going to make anything up, but we'll take invisible light and map it to a color that you can see. And therefore, you can actually sort of, you know, understand what it'll be like to look at the universe with infrared eyes. Incredible. Well, thank you so much for, for chatting with me, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Um, sure. I'm, I'm so excited for you and for the whole team um, to see even more and continued excitement and discoveries like this. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's going to rewrite the textbooks. And uh, I, I'm just I'm just here, you know, gonna, I'm going to enjoy the whole ride. <laughs> and I, I do just have one very, very just kind of for fun last question. Um, you know, obviously there is the meaning behind the name that the star was given, Arendelle, but I imagine that perhaps the person who discovered the star, perhaps you, perhaps members of the team are Tolkien fans. Yeah, we are. So the the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the the young man who discovered the star picked the name, and it's from the Silmarillion, you know, from uh, from Tolkien. And uh, you know, and 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 yeah, I mean, I, I have uh, elvish tattoos. Oh, so, yeah, oh, never, never. We we're Tolkien fans. We love science fiction. <laughs> we love fantasy. 
and um, it means the dawn star in Old English. And that's wonderful because this star, the reason they chose that name, it, it's from the dawn of time. You know, this is the, the first star, the farthest star we've ever seen. And uh, I think uh, Arundel is a beautiful name for it. It really is. Um, yeah, it's it's just a beautiful name. The the Tolkien influence, the meaning behind it. I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again so much, Michelle, for, for making the time. I really appreciate it. Sure. Great to talk with you. So, so you have a, a good day. Thanks. Mm -hmm.